Good morning, South Point. Are you ready to worship Jesus? Come on, there's nothing our God can't do. He's unstoppable. He's amazing. He's great. Come on, let's sing to him. Heaven thunder and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you fall. Faith commanded and the mountains move. Fear is losing ground to our hope.
As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to pray. The Lord, oh my soul. I praise when I don't. I praise cause I know you're still in control. Yes, he is. I praise is a weapon. It's more than a sound. Yes, my praise is a shout that brings Jericho down. Come on, you got a new walls that need to come down. As long as If you don't, here's a few reasons why you should. Here we go. I praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. You reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful. Holy Spirit, 
Come on, church, can we begin to ask for more? All we need is more. We want more. Holy Spirit, we want more. All we need is more. Sin is for creation, the creator sent a flood. On the cusp of new beginnings, he again released a dove. And after all the searching, it found a place to land. On Christ the perfect son, it would redeem it all again. Come on, this is the gospel. Sing it out. It landed on the line. Who went for our redemption? Who went for our redemption? Who went for our redemption? It is not by my own earth to 
I'm the helper at my side The gift was fully purchased when the Lamb was crucified Thank you, Jesus Freely I can ask Him For His blood has washed me clean Let the dove of heaven rest upon the cross Would you come and rest upon us? Let the dove of heaven Don't you want this to be an upper room today? Yeah. You know, don't you want to? Don't, don't you want this to be an upper room where, all of a sudden, you know, you're just up in a room together like this, up in a room together. But all of a sudden, you hear something that's not in the sound system. Hallelujah! Anybody want to have that happen in their life? Or you look over at your brother and your sister, you go, "Whoa, dude! There's like a, like a, the, like a thing over top of you. Like God's coming down on you." How many of you want to see that happen in this room today? Praise God! And then. All of a sudden, then all of a sudden, you don't stay there anymore because you can't stay there any longer. You run down the steps and run out into the city. Tell everybody the mighty acts of God. How many of you want an upper room right here at South Point this morning? Father God, let your spirit pour out on us today. Let your spirit pour out on us today. Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see. Burn a flame in our heart. Let us leave this place on fire, filled, treasuring Jesus to serve you with all of our strength. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to be good today. Hallelujah. Come on, give him a great applause. Praise God. Daniel, run that up here for me. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I did this in the... Um, in the end of the first service, but I'm going to do it here now. I normally I greet you. I just do it real quick. Any followers of Jesus show up today? Just, just a few. And um, uh, but uh, so they, I didn't. I told them they didn't have to stay for both services. They came, but, but I want to do this here. But um, ten years ago, a little over ten years ago, um, I asked. Uh, our, our, let me see how the story would roll out is our children's director had been our children's director since almost the inception of the church. We've only had three CE directors here in the whole life of the church. And um, the lady who had done it for years was kind of like a legend around here, known by everybody. And, um, and so we, uh, she decided to do something else with her life. And we weren't sure what to do because our CE department's big. There's hundreds of kids back there. It's tons of volunteers. It's a big job. And um, we were taken off guard a little bit, and so 
Christina Terrell had worked for us in, in years prior in another administrative position, and, um, but then uh, had gone home to be a mom, and so I, <laughs> I called her up and said, hey, any way I can get you out of retirement? And, uh, uh, and would you consider coming back and at least plugging in while we figure this out? Well, 10 years later, and uh, after 10 years, she, uh, we, she came in and said, look, Pastor Russ and Debbie, it's time for me to make a change, go home again, be a mom and, uh, and a wife and, and, and do life a little bit different, not leaving the church, not going to another city or anything like that. But she goes, my, my season has come to an end, and we understood that. And, um, and, and so I, I want to say a couple of things about her today so that we can at least, because she's finished in the beginning of the year, and uh, Pastor Aaron has put together a whole program for the children and it does things, uh, putting all kinds of curriculums and new things in place so that our children are trained with a higher level of uh, thought. And it, that has nothing to do with Christina. It's the curriculum and, um, and how things are done with the curriculum and what's being taught to our children. So he's rewriting everything. Those of you that are parents know a lot about that. And, um, and so Megan helps with that. So we're good. Every, the children's department's running great. Everything's doing great. And, um, but Christina f served here faithfully. In the years prior, I would have to do a member of uh, volunteer push twice a year. Those of you that were here would know that. You would remember those days. And um, I've only done two in 10 years. One was just here recently. The, to my knowledge, I think it's only two. It might be a couple more I forgot. But hardly ever had to do a volunteer push because they were always farming for them along the way and, um, uh, and, and always and took such good care of the children over all those years. Never did I ever have a thought about, hey, what's wrong or what needs to be fixed. She just did an amazing job. Her and Scott um, been here over 20 years and our core of the church. They're part of the core of South Point. If you look at South Point, they're, they're not just here for the preaching anymore. They're not here for anything anymore. It's, it's home. It's their family. It's who they are. And, um, uh, and they made it and helped form a big part of that. In the darkest, probably the darkest ministry season of my life, either the first or second, I don't know which level it would be, it's right there together. Um, they as a family stood with Debbie and I with loyalty, um, with umph. I mean, they, they fought for us and uh, they talked, they said the right things when we weren't around to the people um, in the church and really helped pull the church back together honestly, and, and save it. They were that important. They were true gatekeepers and culture warriors. Uh, we count them as friends. Uh, they are just amazing. And, uh, but today, um, they're in the room, and I want to, we're not saying goodbye to them, but because they're not saying goodbye, there's no place to, like, give honor. And, um, and they really are, as a family, and Christina, as a CE director over those years, do some honor. So where are you guys? Did you sit in the same place again? Stand up again and let us honor you right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you guys did. And, you know, and here's the thing. I mean, they took care of your kids, and I've met your kids. <laughs> and uh, that's really saying something right there. Right? So, all right. All right. Well, so I want to say some things to kind of lead into this today, be uh, conscious of the time. Uh, so we're on our third message in the Holos series. Holos meaning all, everything, you know, just the whole deal. Um, complete wholeness and uh, really get into it. And... Um, uh, in, in, uh, for the Shema. And, but here's what I see happens all the time in a fast 21 days. The, the middle week. The middle week you start caving. Everybody does, it seems like. Not everybody, but a lot of people do. So it gets to be a little bit like, yeah, I did that last week, and it kind of has this feel like, oh, and I got a whole other week to go, I don't know. And we kind of ease off. So here, here's what I would want today, is, is especially using the context of this message. You'll take this last seven days of the fast and turn up the noise, turn up the volume. Actually, maybe even think about, you know what, I'm kind of slipping a little bit and what I said I wasn't going to do. You know, I've, I dived into social media a couple of times because I didn't want to be forgotten. <laughs> From somebody who lives in Canada. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and so, but you know, all of that's important, I know, for some of you. And, and I don't know what your life would be like without those likes and uh, poor things. And, but, but you've died back in. But if you would maybe go this last seven days, because I was hoping that everybody was going into these 
21 days with certain things in mind that they were hoping to break through, see change, some kind of transformation, believing for certain things on a larger scale. So I, I think a lot of us on a larger scale are believing for um, what would be something like a revival in our church and city. We're believing for something like that. Some of you are believing for people to be healed and delivered. Some of you are believing for miracles in your marriages or at work. Or, and you're just taking this 21 days to really just press in and stand in front of God. Is, would you take this last seven days and push hard? Don't, don't, don't ease off. Push hard. Because you tend to, we all do, your life moves on and you kind of get going. So push hard. And then one thing I would ask, and um, back when we first did this, we started praying on Fridays as men um, at 6.30 in the morning. And it was, we did every Friday in that January, <clears throat> probably two or, I think it was two years ago, two or three. <clears throat> and, um, and then the guys liked it so much, they, um, one of the gentlemen in our church came up and said, hey, I have some guys, they said we should do this every month. And he said, and I'll pay for the breakfast. And I said, okay, and, and I, you know, paying for the breakfast wasn't here or there. If I thought the guys wanted to come, but I was happy for that too. And, um, and so we've been doing it every last Friday for uh, two years now, and, um, and it's been great. We always have anywhere from 70 to 100 guys here. And through the fast, excuse me, <clears throat> through the fast, um, we've seen over 100. We had 130, we had 115, I think, or something like that, 110, I don't know what it was this past Friday. But what we did that one year that made it a, a landmark moment was we really encouraged all the guys, you know, how we do it around here. We made fun of each other and, and uh, you know, they, why, what's wrong with you, you lazy bum? And it's love language around here for guys. And, uh, and, and so, um, uh, and we got 200 guys there that day. And so we'd like to do that again. So that means 90 to 100 of you that haven't come need to come, and the 100 that have been coming need to keep coming. So if you would just call a friend, you know, hey, he wasn't there. <laughs> I had one guy, I, I texted him, I said, hey, would you consider coming next Friday? I'm leaving right now. And I said, you weren't here today. And I'd, I'd love for you to come and maybe just try it one time. And it is a good friend of mine. And, and, um, and he texted me back. He said, okay, I'll pray about it. So I thought, I'm saving this. And, uh, and so he was here today. I thought, I ain't texting back on that one. We're going face to face on this, brother. And, uh, and so he was here, and I pulled him aside. I said, hey, uh, what about you when your pastor asks you to come to a prayer meeting that you got to pray about? I said, what word is it that you have to have? I said, I'm not your wife. I'm your pastor. I'm not a friend. I'm your pastor. What word is it you got to have above your pastor asking you to come to a prayer meeting? What exactly? He's all right. I'll be there. <clears throat> and he brought a visitor. He brought a visitor with him today, and he looked at me and goes, and you're going with me. I said, hallelujah. That's a, that's a. So, if, guys, if you would just, I, I, I know, when it's this weather, you get up, you know, and, and I really, I'm asking, I know some of you have work, and if you would ask your boss, could I come in 30 minutes later? Honestly, I mean that. If you could, if you could ask for a little lee leeway or something like that to come in late, work a little longer, or something like that, to be at that prayer. It's that important to us. Amen. Because I honestly, you could say, well, why, is it, why 200? Is that going to make a big difference? I don't know. Uh, if you don't pray or do anything, maybe not. But if, if 30 of the guys who come that don't normally come said, you know what, that really is amazing. I'm coming for the rest of the year on the last Friday. And uh, we got more men praying like that. You ought to be here. We sang that song that Josh sang today, where that one that has the rap in the middle of it. At 7 in the morning, and guys were jumping all across here, jumping. I mean, not just the young guys, older guys. I'm thinking, well, he's going to be hurting. And, uh, and I think he's going to blow something out right now. Here he goes. And he's bone on bone. He's up there jumping. And so, and, uh, and, and, uh, but, uh, but man, it was, it was just beautiful. And so I, I know I'm taking a lot of time for this, but it's real important. And I pray that you guys would get up. And I know you're going to get up because you're going to get up and it's going to be cold. Like I text a guy that I know in Minnesota, he's a pastor in Minnesota, and I've been working with him, helping him, and I text him this morning, I go, man, I need you guys, it's like 26 below up there or something today, and I, and I said, I need you guys to pray for us, it frosted last night. <laughs> I 
I said, we are really struggling down here. Will you pray for us? And I'd, I don't even have a text back, but I'm sure it'll be a fist. He always sends a fist if he doesn't like it, like hits you in the face. And, uh, and, uh, and so, and, um, but I know you'll get up and it's cold and you're walking to your car to go pray you're half asleep, trying to drink a coffee. You're going to go, God doesn't even want me up in this cold like this. And uh, just go on and come because we want you here. And let's have 200 guys here. Amen. I said, so just do it for Jesus, and let's see if God doesn't do something with us. So I know I took a long time to do that, but I think it will help us a ton. All right, now, I, can, I think I can get down in our time allotted this morning. I knew I was going to do some of these things, so here we go. Everybody ready for the Word of God? Let me read the Shema to you again, what is called the Shema. And um, we are in our Holos series, and we're on the word strength. Love the Lord God with all your strength. Holos, strength. All your strength, all right? Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is Shema, or hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And each time with all is the word holos in Greek. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Don't forget this. There is no other commandment greater than these. Verse 31 is going to lead us through February. Love one another as yourself. It's going to lead us through February. So the word strength here um, is ma'od. M-E with a, like a little apostrophe thing, um, uh, od, O-D, ma'od, it's ma'od. And um, uh, I was going to play a video for you from the Bible Project, guys, and if, and if you want to go home and watch it, you just Google Bible Project ma'od, like I just spelled it, and it'll pull up. It's a little 4 minute and 42 second video, to be precise, and, uh, and, and watch it, and it'll give you a bunch of information, but I was talking with Ed about with Pastor Aaron, he goes, Dad, don't do that. Just tell him what it is. And I go, you know, really, that would save a lot of time. And, um, uh, and, and, uh, and I think, and he was absolutely right. And uh, so here, let me just give you a, a real simple definition. You can't forget it for my own. It's oomph. It's oomph. Like, mm. It's with all your oomph. That's what the word strength is. And it, it, uh, most of the time, everybody thinks it's your body, but it really isn't. Now, we're going to talk about that today, and I'll show you how they relate. But the word itself is your oomph. How much, what are you putting into it? Love the Lord with your heart. Treasure him in your heart. Love him with your soul. Be on fire in your soul. Fill with the Holy Spirit. Love him with your mind. Pastor Ryan's going to talk about that next week, about how you use your mind to think thoughts and search away and memories and all the things that you're building in your mind to treasure Christ and make Christ Lord of all your life using your mind for it. But this one is oomph. It's like push. It's like, it, 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 so if I stop the message right now, which I could because that would be the point, I would ask this one question on the screen. What is your level of intensity in pursuing God and glorifying him in every area of your life? One to ten. One being barely hanging on, no one even knows I'm a Christian, I barely know. Ten, I'm an on fire, most people around me think I'm a fanatic. I don't know that that's bad. But you don't understand, these are the differences. And somewhere in there, what's your oomph in trying to, to, to make God known? What's your level of intensity in pursuing him and glorifying him in every area of your life? What, where, where would you put yourself on the scale? What's the number? Just that, that, and we would stop and answer that question, have an altar call, and see if we couldn't move it a couple of points. You know, if you're a three, let's get to a five. Five to a seven, five, and so on. Now, I want to I explain something because I think people get this wrong all the time. And um, on, on when they're going, yeah, so I'm going to pursue God with all, all the time, so I'm going to be conscious of Jesus. That's what I need to be. Every moment of my life, I want to be like Brother Lawrence, who wrote the book, Practicing the Presence of God, which I hardly know anybody in the world has ever read that book. But Laura Werfel walked up to me the other day and goes, hey, that sounds like Brother Lawrence, something you were saying, or uh, the, she said the book, couldn't remember the author. I thought, I can't believe somebody in this church read Practicing the Presence of God, and, um, and it, several of you may have or not, but it's just an amazing book about a man who tried to practice thinking about Jesus without interruption. And, um, but it, that's really, when you think about what it means to serve with all your strength, kind of impossible. That's not what it is to never lose thought of Jesus. 
So what, how do you do this? I mean, how, how would that work? And uh, so I, I was thinking about it because here's the thing. You'll get up in the morning. you get started. Lord, I'm going to think about you. I'm going to see how far I can go without losing conscious thought of you. And so you're going, I praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Where did I put my shoes? Where's my shoes? Where's my shoes? I put them right here. Who, hey, who moved my shoes? Honey. That's usually what most husbands do. Honey, where's my shoes? And it was most wives go, where did you put your shoes? Yeah, I put them right here. Either you or the kids have moved them until you realize where you actually really left them. And, uh, and, and, and but in, so anyhow, we're back to the story. Where's my shoes? Oh, I left them in the closet. So I go to the closet. There's my shoes. Jesus, you're just good. Man, I got to get me some new shoes. These shoes are worn out. And uh, I saw there was a sale at Dillard's. I'll go to Dillard's tonight. And while I'm at Town Center, I'll stop by and get that because I get that birthday gift for this and that. Next thing you know, it's 930 and you haven't thought about Jesus once. That's normal. Everybody does that. You're going, that's our problem, Russ. No, no, no. I don't think Jesus ever intended for you to walk around and think about Jesus all the time. I don't. There's another way to walk this thing out, and here's what I think it is. It's taking the Word of God to be your guide for who you will be, who you will be, all right, one, <clears throat> who you will be, what you will do and not do, and what you will say and not say, and what thoughts you will allow to stay and which ones you will. It's using the Word of God for who, what, what, and what. And you said, I don't get it, Russ. Okay, now think about it. If you take the principles, precepts, commands, guidelines, corrections, principles of this Word and go, I'm going to live by them today. I'm going to learn them and live by them. The one I use in it. First service I use with you. So if I do the Ten Commandments and I go, I won't lie. So through the day, you go, I'm not going to tell a lie today. I'm not going to lie. And here's where the command brings the presence of Jesus into it. You get a chance to. Did you finish that report? Yes, it's on my desk. I'll bring it tomorrow, which means I'm not finished. The check is in the mail. Sometimes that's true, and sometimes that means something totally different, like I forgot to write the check or I don't have the money to write the check. But when you decide not to lie, you go, no, sir, I didn't get it done. Uh, I'll work overtime tonight to get it done, or you want me to run get it? I left it on my desk at home. It's not here right now, but I told the truth, and I let the Word of God be my guideline for my moments in life. That's just one. There's literally hundreds of precepts and commands that would guide our life. You start with the Ten Commandments, but then you work your way out into other precepts and commands. And here's what happens. As you obey, you meet Jesus all along the way. All right? As you do that. So here, 1 John chapter 5, verses 3 through 4, uh, New Living Translation. Loving God means keeping his commandments. I'm only going to read verse 3. And his commandments are not burdensome. Now, let me say, read it again real slow. Loving God, that's what we're talking about today, means what? Keeping his commandments. And his commandments aren't burdensome. In other words, it's not a weight to keep them. In my opinion, it actually takes weight off of your life. All right? But loving God is keeping his commands. Keeping his commands is a word that we tend to always read in some disciplinary fashion, obedience. But obedience is just doing what you're supposed to do, what you were told to do, what you were commanded to do, and anything else is disobedience. All right? So when you love God, you just keep his word. So your manner of life, how you align with his word, is the issue here. When it's the oomph. When you're going, how do I do all of my life? It's, do you bring these principles to bear in your life, in all of your life? How you interact with the lost, 
how you interact with your boss, how you interact with your coworkers, how you interact with the fellow students, how you interact with the world, how you interact with media, how you inter everything about you that interacts with the world, is it guided by the principles of the word and is the word becoming evident in how you live your life and who, what, what, and what you are. And therefore, when you do that, you are meeting Jesus all along the way. You don't have to think about Jesus all the time. He will be there at the point of your obedience. Because you'll know you are obeying because you love him. Is that clear? So I hope that helps you kind of understand what you can do and how you can do ma'od, how you can live with all you got is put more of this word as the guideline for how you live your daily life. There's so many things I want to say. But it, so... I didn't say this, but if you look in here, the different ways to praise God. I mean, there's like seven, eight, nine ways to praise God. Shout, yell, dance, clap, all of that. How many of those have you ever done? You ought to try them. You say, Russ, I don't, I'm not going to dance before the Lord in front of somebody. Have you ever danced before the Lord before the Lord? He says it was embarrassing. Why? Who saw you? It was just you and Jesus out there. He liked it. So why are you embarrassed? I'm just saying you do these things, you apply them to your life, you'll meet Jesus there. When you apply the word to your life and do the word, you'll meet Jesus there. And he'll be present all the time. So that's my ode. So the more you do of that, he's, he's saying that, do more of that. Worship, love me with more of your life. More of my principles guiding you who you are. More of my precepts guiding how you think. More of my commands showing you the way to live, what to say and not to say, what to do and what not to do. More. Oomph. Praise God. But when you, so there's the context of it. So we could be done right now, take an altar call and go home. I know there's a lot of you going, hallelujah. <laughs> but I couldn't miss the opportunity because most people think this is the body, the physical body. And it, it isn't, but it is, because you can't, what, I'm just, what I just said, none of the things I'm talking about can you do without a body. You can't serve one another without a body. You can't love one another without a body. You can't worship out loud without a body. You gotta have a body. So when you consider the word strength or power, you can't help but start thinking about the physical body. You say words like strength, you start thinking about muscles. It's just the way it is. So obviously, I want to say, I'm going to say some things about the body today, um, and we'll see how we do here, and uh, I think it's helpful. Obviously, your body is created by God and is very, very important to him. Your body is very important to God. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. We read that last week. But now I want to go back to the beginning of the verse, kind of look at it, and here, here's God. And the way I look at it, now listen, how that all looked and when he says formed out of the dust of the ground, all I have is science fiction movies and stuff like that to work with, right? So I really don't know how it worked, but it's, it's kind of like Play-Doh or something is that God took something of the substance of this world and made ligaments and cells and eyeballs and fingers and, you know what I'm saying? He, he made tissues, organs, and formed them, and there it sat, right in front of him. It was first, he formed it first because he had something he was gonna do with it. He didn't form it and go, oh man, that's cool, what am I gonna do with it? He formed it to do something with it, and that was to breathe his spirit into and give it life. So it became a living soul from last week. The body was not this avatar that we inhabit. And uh, you, how many of you know what an avatar is? That's a skinny blue man. No, no, no. An avatar, an avatar is, is a, is a, another form that a spirit takes shape in and can move from avatar to avatar. That's an avatar. Our, your body's not an avatar. 
No, no, no. Your body's way more important than that to God. And uh, it, it's not just some prison for your soul. It is you. He breathed his spirit into this body, and this body became a living being. The soul wasn't the living being. The body wasn't the living being. The spirit and the body together were the living being. Now, this is super important. And this is all done within the confines of a moral order. There's a, there's a moral order to everything that God does. He's going to put out a set of rules for this new living human. And they were super simple. Super simple. I'm going to read another verse because I don't want to miss this before I get on to this. Psalms 139, verses 14 through 16. And I just am so excited that this verse is the right verse for today because of what today is. Today is Pro-Life Sunday in America. Yesterday, there was a march in D.C. I forget how many are there. Thousands, tens of thousands of people marching for the rights of the unborn. We're a church that stands for the rights of the unborn. We believe in that. And, uh, and we, we know it's controversial. We're fine. We try to be loving while we take a stand. And um, so here's one of the main, this is verses being read all over America today and yesterday. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Now, when he says the depths of the earth, what's he talking about? We all know, in a mother's womb. That's what he's talking about. Your eyes, now watch this. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. Your unformed substance. People say, when does life start? I'm going, I don't know what you scientists think. But right here in the Bible, when you guys catch up with the Bible, you'll finally realize it's an unformed substance. It doesn't have to have limbs. It doesn't have to be formed. It doesn't have to be able to think. It is God's created human being right there. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. This verse is read all over the country this weekend. Because this, the only, really the only group pretty much that protects the unborn in their mother's womb is the church in America. It's pretty much all that's left for them. We're the only ones who even say that's a life in there. Be careful with it. And I know, I know there are people here today going, oh, Russ, I'm going to feel so judged now. Look, first of all, God forgave you, didn't he? Aren't you living in his mercy and grace? He forgave me for all my sin. And I still got to preach about it. I got all kinds of things I got to preach about that I've done. Anybody hearing me out there? Am I in the right church? I got a good group of sinners to walk with. Got saved from a lot of really bad stuff. Anybody out there? Yeah, Mark. I'm in Mark Pond, way bad. I'm just teasing. I'm just <laughs> and, uh, but, and, and so... So I don't mean that. I don't want anybody to feel condemned for what's taking place, but I don't want anybody to feel condemned about anything that's taking place that's under the blood of Jesus. For any sin. If you've been asked, if you've repented and asked for forgiveness and you've moved on in life, become a preacher of the gospel. Preach what's right. Don't let the devil give you some kind of false shame. Now, back to what I want to say. So we take care. This is kind of a caveat I'm kind of off in a cul-de-sac here but it just fits when it comes to the body is that we have to make our stand and believe without fear so that's why we know we've got to help moms that have an unwanted pregnancy so we give money to the problem pregnancy centers in our city we try to get people to volunteer there honestly it'd be a great way for a lot of you go volunteer if nothing else write them a check and drive it over there to the problem pregnancy center because those people are saving lives they're literally saving lives. And it, it is, it's, such, it's so important to us and anybody we can save. And I, I know we all know now that we, we won the federal case and that shoved it all down into the states and, and now it's down to state battles. And so really nothing's really changed. We still have to fight. And here's the thing, in a, in a state that is not pro-life, they're still going to have Free, you know, abortions are going to be on demand and readily available to whoever needs one. 
60, over 60% 60 of the American population, and many of them are born again believers, not many, but some are born again believers, think it's all right under certain circumstances or any circumstances to have an abortion. So the truth is in America for a while, there's gonna be abortions everywhere, pretty much easy. All you gotta do is drive across the state line. We get that. But here's the thing. So you say, well, Russ, what do we do if we're, if we're losing? Listen, the church has never fought because it was gonna win or lose. The church fought for what was right. So even if you lose till the end of your life, when you're standing for what is right, you fight for what is right. It's not about winning or losing. I hope we win. I, I hope we shut it down. I hope we rid our nation of it. I hope there's other ways. But if we don't, and it turns 70% and 80% and 90%, I'm still going to be pounding on this desk going, hey, this is wrong. There's another way. Let's hold the truth. God's going to help us. Amen. You preach truth. Win or lose. And if you've got to win to preach what's right, you're going to raise horrifying children. You're going to be horrified by your own children as they age because they have zero backbone. Zero. Anyhow, with that said, thank you for those of you who make a stand. Thank you for help moms see their way through. And by gosh, let's pray, raise money, and save as many lives as we can all the life that we live. And everybody said, Amen. and please don't feel judged. If that's you, you said, man, I did that like three times. I thought it was the way to stay free. You know what? I'm so glad you're here. Yes. Because you should never feel another day of shame or guilt or pain. Right. Because my Jesus loves you so much Amen. and washes all of us so clean. But let's live truth. Yes. Everybody good? Praise Thank you for letting me have that moment. That wasn't part of this sermon, but I made it a part. <clears throat> so we know that God really cares about our bodies. Now, I don't have time to do a theological treatise on God's creation of the human body. It's like books written on that. And, um, but I, I do want to make a, a statement or two here. And, um, uh, and so the first one I want to say is that our bodies are talking to us. <clears throat> our bodies are talking to us, all right? Now, here, here's what I mean. Genesis 2-7 makes it clear that God made this man or this human, and because uh, I know we're divided later for man and male, male and female, but he makes this and breathes his life into it so they're one entity. The spirit and the body, you can't separate them. Yeah. You, you can't separate them. The only time that I understand in biblical framework that there's ever a separation is when you die and leave that body, that one that you're tired of, <laughs> When you're done with that one and you leave until the moment of the resurrection of the dead. Now, I, I don't fully understand all of that. I have not done studies on that. I'm sure it's all available and somebody knows. But that period of time between the death of this body and the resurrection of your glorified body, that, that is a time I don't fully have a grasp on. But here's what I do want you to know. You will have a glorified body. So God intends for you to be a human body or body like this, a glorified version of this, all throughout eternity. Right, right. <clears throat> so bodies are important to God. They're not prisons for the soul. They're not avatars for you to hang out in until you're done. They're important to him. Your body is, all right? And they're talking to you. <clears throat> now, you're going to see where I'm going before I want you to see it, but here we go. They are, uh, in defining who you are, they are inseparable, inseparable, in defining your identity. Your spirit and your body both define your identity. You're not defined by your inner world only. You're also defined by your exterior world, your body. God's design. He created them male and female. So there's more to you than your body, but not less. There's more to you than your body, but not less. All right? So... You have to understand, when God formed the first human, he didn't make them and then turn them loose. All right, I'm, I'm getting to the point here. He didn't go, oh, wow, that's amazing. Let's see what they do and put them out there. No, there was a moral order immediately. 
I want you to know, men and women, male and female, was created in the moral order with the moral code. He, there were rules in the beginning. Here, here's what they were, a super simplified version. Have a lot of children. Have a lot of children. Number two, take all the stuff of the world, wood, metal in the ground, water, power, electricity, find it in the sky, turn it into something you can make, and take all the stuff of this world that I've given you and make something amazing with it. So God actually, when somebody invented the chair, God liked it almost as much as you did. He went, there you go. Now you can sit down without hurting. And we've made amazing things. We fly around in tin cans from nation to nation. I don't think God was going, man, this is a bad deal. This is the Tower of Babylon. No, he told us, take the stuff of this world and make amazing things. And then he said one other thing, and don't eat of that tree. Have a lot of kids. Take what I've given you and make something amazing in it. Keep the seventh day holy. I could add a few rules, but we won't right now. And, and don't eat of that tree. Well, of course, it didn't take long to eat of that tree. When they broke that rule, everything unraveled. Everything got all goofed up. The moral order, the moral code was broken, and it severed man's relationship with God. Now, I want to get right to the point here because I want to say this. Our bodies are not objective things that we tell it what it is. We are not blank canvases. Our bodies are not blank canvases that we paint from the inside. Now, you're going to be quiet, and it's okay. You don't have to shout. I, I, get, I get where you might feel right now, but you've got to hear me. Come on. We're not blank canvases that we paint from the inside. Our bodies have their own voice. Yes. God made you a certain way, yes. and that speaks to your identity. Right. So if he made you male, you're male. Outside and in. Your body tells your inside who you are. Your inside doesn't tell your body who you are. Your body has a voice. If you're a female, God made you a female, you are a female. So people say all the time, and remember, God loves your body. He made your body. He honors your body. It's important to him that you don't deny it. So you go, well, what about me if I have desires for the same sex? I'm going, okay, I got it. I think that's very possible. They go, okay, then what, what, um, what do I, what's wrong with me on the inside? I'm going, that's the right question. I say, when somebody comes to me and go, I, I have I have this overwhelming desire and I just want to sleep with as many men or women as I possibly can. I just love it. It's just amazing. It's a desire. I'm going, okay, I get it. I think that's a legitimate desire. I didn't say a holy one or a right one, but I know people have that desire. Can we all, you understand what I'm saying? I'm not denying that you have the desire. I'm not going to say that, that there's something so innately strange that you could ever have a desire like that. It, it's real. People have it. I, I don't fully understand how certain things work, but I, I believe it. I, it's a desire. Some people cannot not eat. Their, their desires are just too strong. Their desires are just too powerful. So when you look at it and you look at these things, you go, when people go, what do I do with this desire? The same thing I tell an adulterer to do with their desire. The same thing I tell somebody who wants to go steal all the time to do with their desire. If it's a desire that runs contrary to the Word of God, I'm going, okay, I'm not, I'm not saying you don't have it, but you can't do it. You can't violate the Word of God because you have desire. Desire doesn't run the show. The Word of God runs the show. You understand? And so you don't, from the inside, go, I, I think I'm really, I'm in a male body, but I, I am a female. I'm going... Okay, that's something going on inside of you. I'm not going to argue with what is going on inside of you. That, that is a reality, but here's the thing. Your body has a voice. 
So no matter how loud you try to say, I'm really not, I'm a woman in a man's body, I'm going to go, no, I'm sorry, you're not. You're a, you're a man that is struggling with your image of being a man. I get that. Let's start there. I don't think you, I, I think there's legitimate things you've got to work through. We're not going to throw you out. We're not going to throw you away unless you tell me that your desire is going to run the show, not the Word of God. Then I'm going, well, then I have nowhere to go with you until you change your mind. Okay? Our bodies have a voice. They just do. So I hope, I hope you'll stay with me on that. I'm sure a lot of you would like to figure out how to get up. A few of you did. <laughs> and I, I understand it's hard to take because in this world we're told that you're not supposed to make that stand. And, uh, but if you don't, where is the church going? And here's the, here's the thing. I'm not angry at anybody. I don't think anybody's weird. Like, I won't touch you, cooties. I love these people. I get it. Deception, all kinds of things going on. And we're all struggling trying to find our way out of some weird desire that we wish we didn't have. Amen. It might be littler things, you know. Like, I'll be glad to grab a chip bag when this 21 days is over. Anybody ready for your food when you get over this thing? You're like, man, I can't wait. I'm going to eat a pie, like the whole thing. And uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm just going to cram it. And um, so I, I get it. Anyhow, let's move on, because the other part that I want to talk about, and then we'll close, is that when you think about the body, the human body, not only does it have a voice, um, and then you have to heed its voice because it's God's creation. It's not this thing we don't like. And, and I do get this by the Well, I'll get here in this is that we must be good stewards of our bodies. we got to be good stewards of our bodies. L let me read a few scriptures to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 26 through 27. So I do not run aimlessly, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. I, look at Paul, he's going, I discipline my body. What's he discipline? His mind? He's saying this time, he does discipline his mind. His body, his, he, because his body has a voice. My body wants to do this. I'm feeling this desire. I've got this physical energy. I've got this kind of thing going on inside of me. I've got these hormones raging. I got a, that's all body, right? That's all a part of our body. And, and, and he goes, I discipline it. I don't let it run the show so that I won't be disqualified. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. What your body does. That's why Paul says, don't join your body to a prostitute. And you go, that's just my physical body, but my spirit wasn't there. I've heard that. <laughs> I'm going, what now? And uh, they go, it wasn't me. I'm inside me. That was just my body doing my body's thing. I'm going, brother, let me tell you something. That was you, stupid. That was you. Your, your body is you. Oh. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Then it talks about transforming your mind. First of all, present your bodies. Then transform your mind. Pastor Ryan's going to talk about that next week. But your bodies, what you do with your bodies is important to Jesus. It really is. So take care of it. And man, I have all kinds of things. So those of you going, man, I'm about to feel real judged here for the next 10 minutes or so. Hang on. Let me just tell you something. I, I, I've only learned a lot of this stuff about body abuse at the end of my life, sadly. All right, so I just want you to know, there's a lot of things I'm teaching you. Listen to me over there, anybody that's younger, anybody that's got a way out of this thing. Like, for instance, I, um, <laughs> I played basketball till way late in life. Most guys quit playing basketball in their 30s somewhere. That's the later, that's the late guys. But not me. I found out if you would take ibuprofen, you could play forever. No, seriously, I'm not even, I don't even know how to exaggerate this story that I'm about to tell you. I didn't know, 
I don't read things on bottles. I don't, I, there wasn't an internet then to tell me 6,000 reasons to not take that many ibuprofen every day. I actually thought it was a gift from God. Because if I would dump down six, eight ibuprofen in a day, I could play in the morning and then go back and play at night. My knees were soft, my muscles were good. I didn't even have to stretch. Just take these beautiful pills. I played till I was 48 years old. I just, and just, and on a tournament weekend, I could take 10 of those things. And I just thought, this is, a, thank God that God must have made these. So here, just a couple of few years ago, about three or four years ago, I'm in there and because there was a couple of numbers. And don't you, how many of you older people are sick of numbers? I am so sick of numbers because none of them are right anymore. Every time I get my report back, high, 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 low. Oh, good, it's a low one. That's the good stuff. You don't have enough of that. I'm going, oh, great. And high, high. I mean, my blood reports are the most depressing thing I've ever seen in my life. And so one of them, they said, you know, you better go get this check. So I go get this check, and they look at me, and they go, uh, look, they show me this gas meter thing, and they go, you have just enough kidneys to carry you to the end of your life. I'm going, well, how'd that happen? And um, they, then they go, <laughs> the, the nephrologist goes, did you ever take ibuprofen? I said, yeah, occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> I said, because I was going to wait, because I, I kind of wanted to know what the consequences were if I told him the truth. You know, he wasn't letting me in on the whole story. He just asked me the question first. He didn't go, this is the, if you did this, he just asked me the question, did you ever take ibuprofen? I'm going, ah, you know, normal people take it. And, uh, and so I'm beating around the bush and, and I go, well, yeah, I, I actually took a lot. He said, well, how much? I said, I'm on a daily basis for about 10 years, maybe six, three, five. Depends on if I was in a tournament or how much ball I was trying to play. He goes, how much now? I said, I didn't know. I said, you tell me that was wrecking. He goes, it's pretty common knowledge now that if you take that much ibuprofen, you ruin your kidneys. And he said, you have shot yours. He said, but thank God you're here now. He said, if you'll quit taking them, keep your blood pressure down and stop doing anything you like in life. And that's that moment where you're going, no, I'm just going to go ahead and die. Shoot me right now. You know I mean, why, why stay here? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever been to one of those doctor's appointments? You're going, God, what's left? I'm eating carrots. You know, everybody bragging about sourdough bread. They said, it's good for your stomach. I said, praise God. So I'm eating sourdough bread every morning. I'm trying to figure out some inflammation things, and Debbie goes, you know gluten's the number one cause of inflammation. It's that sourdough bread. I go, well, there goes that now. What else you want? I was mad. I said, what else you want from me? Just shoot me. <laughs> so I, I'm not here to do any kind of judgment. I, I don't, I'm not gonna get up here and say, hey, let's all turn into the in-shape church. You know, everybody's got, all the guys got abs and all the ladies found their figure again. And everybody's working out like crazy people. I, I'm really not saying that. I mean that. Most, I, a lot of you are not going to do that. And I, maybe just take care of yourself. I just want to be that gentle. Everybody's not going to want to do all that stuff, but maybe, maybe go ahead and drop those pounds. I'm going to tell you why here in just a second. It's different than what you think. It's not this cultural thing of image and I'm going to look a certain way so that people, when they look at me, they think I'm a certain thing. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I don't, I don't care about that. That's kind of dark, actually. I'm talking about you having enough energy yes. to read your Bible wide awake. Yes. 
I I'm talking about you having enough energy at this end of life to actually have a little bit of spirit for your grandkids. Or even better, to come all through the years of your marriage because you took care of each other, that you actually enjoy one another physically because you took care of yourselves. Because a lot of people stop and they have all these reasons, but really what it is is just because they haven't taken care of themselves physically and they've lost the joy of that. They don't have energy, they're tired. Just because they won't look at certain simple rules. You don't have to go nuts. I'll tell you another one. Is everybody good with me right now? I'm, just stay with me just a second. I really am almost done. So I'm in for another blood test. Those things are hellish. And so the, he, go, the, the, he says, hey, your triglycerides are up. I'm going, what? What is that? And he said, well, you're just eating too many carbs and sugar. He said, but we have some medicine. Just take this. I'm going, more medicine? I said, you mean if I stop eating this, I can... Don't have to take that? And he goes, well, yeah, but, and then he goes, like, and it's serious, and I understood this. He goes, but nobody ever stays with it. They go for a month or two, and he said, really, your health, it's hard on your heart. You go, just take the medicine. And something happened inside me that day. I wish it would happen for everything. It's the same thing that happened to me when I was putting down my last pack of cool cigarettes a couple of months ago. <laughs> I know people are going, whoa, what's a cool cigarette? K-O-O-L, menthol, baby, menthol. And I'd just gotten saved 51 years ago, and I'd just gotten saved. And uh, I was still smoking two packs of cool a day. I didn't know. And I set the thing on my toolbox in the factory I worked in, and it said, Surgeon General says these are hazardous, not possibly dangerous, hazardous to your health. And I just heard a sermon on something like this. I thought, I'll never smoke another one of those things again. I never did. I just stopped on a dime. I never put another one in my mouth. Why? Well, I, I did a sermon one time where I smoked one in front of everybody to make a point, but you should have saw that one. That was a good one. I didn't inhale. I'm feeling really good today. I've been feeling real good in both services. Could be, <laughs> just bear with me. I get in these moods sometimes and I'm actually really enjoying myself today. Yeah. Look out, Debbie, I'm coming home. And uh, it is so. <laughs> and I put them down so the doctor, looked, and the same thing happened to me. I'm going, no, give me three months, I'll be back. I came back three months, my triglyceride count was way down. And he said, how'd you do that? I said, I'll, I'll never eat another dessert in my life. He goes, oh, do you want, I said, no, 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 listen to me. I said, I didn't say I'll never have chips. I'd love chips. I didn't say I won't have some crackers. I said, I won't have dessert for the rest of my life. I ate dessert for 67 years. That's good. I said, I can go to heaven without dessert. Don't need it. I said, you're not giving me that medicine until my body won't fix itself. I said, I, I don't know what medicine's doing to me, and I want every piece of mental faculty I've got in my prayer time. I, I want to have my mind so clear as I move into my elder years so I can help with wisdom and strength and anointing, lead the church into its great places all across the country and here in Jacksonville. I want a body that can have enough energy to get on a plane and go somewhere and come home and not be so exhausted I can't see straight. I want to be able to have enough to give to Debbie throughout all the end of my life and give her all that I've got and have fun and do things. I said, so I looked at him, I said, so I just decided, and that was over a year ago, and I haven't touched a dessert since and never will. You're going, well, Russ, I feel bad. I eat dessert. Well, your numbers ain't high. Have one. Think of me while you do. <laughs> eat you a piece of pie. I'm not saying that. We're not saying all these, we're not trying to tell people how to eat. Go eat you a piece of pie. I mean, you should. If your numbers aren't high and you're healthy, eat a cookie. That's not what I'm, I'm not saying go run every day, but do enough exercise. 
take care of your body because the better you take care of your body, the easier it's going to be for you to worship Jesus. That's all I'm saying. The better your body is, the more and easier it will be for you to worship and serve Jesus throughout the days of your life. So please just be good stewards. Take care of it. Do what you need to do so you can serve your family, serve your mate, have the energy to pursue God. That's all I'm saying. Some of you are going, I'm not, I'm not fat. I'm going, but you're skinny and unhealthy. And everybody, you know, trying to get their image down. I told you this last week. I'll say it again. I'm done. <laughs> Finish one little thought. But I, we don't really know what's beautiful to God yet. Some of you skinny folks may be real ugly to Jesus. Yeah, when you get to heaven, he may go, ooh, dude, we got to put some pounds on you. And uh, you got no belly or anything, you know what I mean? Uh, that, that's ugly. Whoa, you feel bad about yourself? You actually posted that? I'm serious. You may get up there and you may not have hair. Hallelujah. You may all be gray. I mean, come on, ladies. There's hardly anybody in here with your real hair color. <laughs> just saying, I'm just, I'm, I got you. You know what I'm? Mean? Hallelujah! And thank God for makeup and all the men said. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Looks better painted to me. <laughs> if you knew what was in my mind right now, we'd never get home. So let me finish right now. Come back to the context. I want you to go home with this. One to ten. Where are you in your umph? One to ten. Where are you in your umph? That's it. And if you're a two, what are you going to do to get to four before this fast is over? If you're five, what are you going to do to get to seven before this fast? What are you going to do this year to move up the scale with your, all your strength? Amen. Second thing, take care of your body the best you can. It's going to break. You're going to, as you age, you're going to get arthritis. You're going to get inflamed. Organs aren't going to work right. Bones are going to be stiff. Backs are going to compress. Muscles are going to be not as flexible. I know all the kids are going, shoot me now. Just get me out of here. So I'm not saying we're all going to feel amazing all the days of our life, but just take care of you and do the best you can with whatever God serves you with. Because there's a lot of people who are in a chair that would love to be you, who can't move like you can. And they go, man, take care of your body because you can't believe what it's like to sit in here every day of your life. So take care of your body. And then I want to tell you my goal for the Shema. Here's my goal. People go, what, what is the 21-day goal? Here it is. If you look at the Shema, it's all about, one, building love for God. Love in your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind. Loving God more. But then... The second part, and there's actually more in the little scrolls that are rolled up inside the Jewish canisters. What are they called? Um, uh, they're called the, uh, gosh, I'm sorry, but they put them on their doors. It has, yes, thank you. Have the scriptures about teach your children, which is fascinating. And, but just the part that Jesus said, he said, love God more. He says, and then love others like you love yourself. So now let's think about it. What would the goal of the 21-day fast be if we're building it all around the Shema? More love everywhere. You say, how about revival, Russ? Here'd be revival for me because I remember one. When everybody just loved God and was umphing towards him with all they had. So much umph towards God. To learn, to find out, to be what he wanted them to be. But then they would look at each other and go, you're my brother. You're my, we're in this together. No guilt, no shame. Come on. Let's go serve Jesus together. And loving one another. 
looking around the room and judgment falls to the ground and unforgiveness disappears and grace flows and people are just encouraging one another, loving one another. You just love to be together. You don't even want to turn on a movie or a show or anything when you're together. You just want to hear each other talk. There's just love flowing, so much love. And I'm telling you, when you love the world, when you love one another, when you love your family, I want more love in your homes. I want more love in your marriages. I want more love for your children. I want more love to come out of you at work. I want more encouragement. I want you to be the great lifters of the world, the lights that shine in darkness in love. Then you can preach truth that's hard because you're great lovers of people. And they'll feel it while you're, while you're correcting them. They'll go, but he loves me. Like I said in the first service, there's two ways to correct. One correction is you're holding them, shaking them, going, you've got to get your life together. And you're looking down at them because really what you want is for them to hear you and be over them. The right way to correct is up. And you're shaking them from down here going, Get up and be who you're supposed to be. I'm not trying to be over you. I'm trying to get you up there. When there's love, everything changes. So the goal of the fast for me is a fire of love that burns through this church in life groups and homes. And there you have it. Father God, help us to have that. Grant us, Lord, as we press in this last week, maybe just amp it up a little bit to drive towards you with some more oomph, a little more energy, a little more intentionality, more intensity. God, may you let love burn in our hearts for you and for the world and people around us, love, that we be great givers. We'll lose sight of ourselves so much because we're so in love with them. Help us, Lord God, to be a church on fire with holy love. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. We're going to um, thank you so much. We're going to receive the Sunday morning tithes and offerings. And uh, so if you would prepare yourself to give, you know there's three ways. Um, you can text South Point CC to 77977. Obviously, you can use the app, and please use our app. Don't forget, the Holos prayer things, uh, they, each day there's a, a prayer guide, and they're not real long. There's a thought and then a prayer. Pastor Ryan writes them. I honestly think these are the best ones he's written on any year yet. They are super good, and I have really enjoyed them. And uh, so please get to those and read those and use those. You have to have our app to do that, and you can give through the app. You can use the envelopes in the chair in front of you there with a check or cash and then drop it in the box on your way back. And I know a lot of you just give online. That's what Debbie and I do. But remember to worship God um, in this moment because you're not physically doing something. Remember to engage in worship with that and tell him how much you love him and why you're giving. Amen? Then we're going to see a quick video and Pastor Tyler is going to get up and get us on the road. Okay? Father God. Thank you for this offering. Thank you for these people that are faithful. Thank you for their blessing. And I do pray as they give, Lord God, as they give, that you'll reward them with a manifold return, that it'll be pressed down, it'll be shaken together, it'll be flowing over. That God, they'll, they'll start wondering how it is they could ever outgive you because you bless them so much. Let our heart, us have a heart of obedience and worship in our giving. Thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you give. We've kept coming to South Point because of the community that we've developed here, the, the families that we got connected to through our life groups. We were able to see people, have real conversations, and um, really develop relationships and do life together. Um, we couldn't see ourselves anywhere else. It's, it's different. It's not like going to church and, and having a, a formal kind of um, meeting, you know. It gives you a place where I feel like you can love and serve like Jesus did, but also feel love and serve at the same time. I feel like you can see and discover and aspects of God that you wouldn't have discovered on your own. Um, it empowers you to be the best you can be and be the light that God has called you to be. This guy in our life group, you know, he was on a trip with one of his coworkers to go do training. And 
basically shared the gospel with him. And that was really convicting to be bold. They took the step of faith to share the good news with this person who really, really needed it. So then what I've done is turned around and been bold in the way that I talk to my coworkers. Uh, I'm taking the opportunity in one-on-one -on -one conversations to insert the gospel. Even when I know that the person that I'm talking to does not share the same beliefs that I do. And so it's been really encouraging to have brothers to walk with and that sense of belonging is really strong and helps us to do things that we probably wouldn't do otherwise. We're definitely um, created to walk with people and to um, not walk this world alone. My husband and I have gone through pregnancy losses and we actually lost four in that season um, in many different occasions. And Life Group was very helpful and powerful in a way where they stood by me. Um, even in those season two, after my first pregnancy loss, I was diagnosed with cancer and had to go through chemotherapy for three months. Um, and that season was when I felt the power of life group because I had ladies that I can call and text, even if they didn't even know what I was going through, I felt the love of Jesus knowing I have peace and comfort that I have not just Jesus, but I have people that care and love me. So that was a tough season and it kept me through and kept me grounded. And that's why I joined Life Group. And that's why I keep going to Life Group. Life is hard and I don't want to walk this world alone. I would encourage anybody to, to join a Life Group. It, it brings you into the heart of South Point um, and really lets you see who we are as a people of God. I think that the role that the life group plays is vital to the life of the church. And it's arguably one of the most important things we have at South Point. Come on, who loves your life group? Trying to find Matt Radloff, I love that guy. There he is. Man, I love him. Guys, we love our life groups. There's a life group guide right in there, right there in your seat. Um, if you're new or, or not involved in a life group, we want to encourage you today to get signed up. So our life groups meet uh, all throughout the week for about an hour. Uh, and we come together as a group of believers just to really grow in our faith and to grow together. And so look in that guide. There's a, there's a group that works just for you. And so how you sign up for that, guy, for that group is by grabbing your Connect card, which is also right there in your seats. And at the bottom, you can put in that, uh, that, that life group a code. And you can put that down there. Or you can just check, hey, I want to join a life group. We would love to, uh, to see you take that step of faith today. Also, speaking of Connect cards, there's a lot of different ways you can fill it out. There, you can scan the QR code, you can text MYSCC to 484848, or you can just use that Connect card right there in your seat. And especially if you're new, we would love for you to fill out the Connect card because we want to help you get connected. We want to answer any questions that you might have. So Pastor Ryan and his team, they're going to reach out to you this week. And so just so glad that you're here with us and cannot wait to get connected with you and to help you get connected here. And one of the greatest way we, one of the greatest ways that we get connected here at South Point is through Grow Track. Everyone say Grow Track. So Grow Track is right after church, right out these doors on my right. You're going to see the Grow Track sign. Go up there for a few minutes. It's all about become this week, about who we are becoming in Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want to become all that God has created me to be, and I know you do too. So join us for Grow Track right after service. It's going to really help you grow here uh, and take your next step here at this church. Another great next step that we have for you, we just have two more things, is financial peace. Maybe this year you're like, I gotta get my finances in order. I gotta figure this out. And so we have a class set aside just for that called Financial Peace University, led by Joe Stewart and his team. And so how you can sign up for that is go on the church website or the app, click on events, and right there, you're going to see financial peace. Click on that, sign up for that, and your life is going to be transformed in your finances. Now, for our last announcement, I want you guys to stand and just go over this together. What are we finishing as, as a church over this last seven days? What are we doing? We're doing the fast together. So I love what Pastor Russ said. Oh, like, let's go a little bit harder this week. 
Let's take on, I just, I just challenged all of our youth group to fast all media. So parents, I'm praying for you guys <laughs> oh, as they're crying. But hey, I believe that they're going to grow in their faith. And I believe you are too. So take that one more step. And then last but not least, Friday morning at 6.30, what do we have, men? We have our men's prayer. We are going to have at least 200 people here because you're going to be there. Amen? And God's going to use you to get someone else there. I'm praying and believing that we're going to have so many men here on Friday, so many students, so many college students, so many men, that we're not going to have enough food in the rotunda to feed us. Because all we need is our daily bread. Whew, come on. God's ready to move in our men, and we want to see you there on Friday at 6.30. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word that it lit up today in our hearts. And I pray this week that we would give you every area. God, may there not be anything in our life that we would keep to the side. God, you're bringing it out in the light. God, take it. It's yours. And God, as you change us, Lord, change this city. We just lift up Jacksonville, Florida to you. Thank you for placing us here. May we be the ones that go out into this city to help the hurting, the lost, and the broken. We love you, God. In your mighty name that we pray, all God's people said, amen. amen. We love you guys. God bless.